Our third scripture lesson this morning comes from the letter to the Hebrews, chapter 12, verses 1 through 13, and that starts on page 176 of the New Testament in your pew Bibles. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and the sin that clings so closely, and let us run with perseverance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith, who, for the sake of the joy that was set before him, endured the cross, disregarding its shame, and has taken his seat at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such hostility against himself from sinners, so that you may not grow weary or lose heart. <coughs> Excuse me. In your, in your struggle against sin, <clears throat> you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood, and you have forgotten the exhortation that addresses you as children. <clears throat> My child, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, or lose heart when you are punished by him. For the Lord disciplines those whom he loves, and chastises every child whom he accepts. <clears throat> Endure trials for the sake of discipline. God is treating you as children, for what child is there whom a parent does not discipline? If you do not have that discipline in which all children share, then you are illegitimate and not his children. Moreover, we had human parents to discipline us, and we respected them. Should we not be even more willing to be subject to the Father of spirits and live? For they disciplined us for a short time as seemed best to them, but he disciplines us for our good, in order that we may share his holiness. Now, discipline always seems painful rather than pleasant at the time, but later it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. Therefore, lift your drooping hands and strengthen your weak knees and, <clears throat> and make straight paths for your feet, so that what is lame may not be put out of joint, but rather be healed." The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Author of life, we thank you for your word, and we ask that your spirit would be with us this morning to transform us in heart, mind, and soul. Amen. We've come to the end of another liturgical year, and as we wrap up another cosmic cycle, we conclude with the solemnity of our Lord Jesus Christ, King of the Universe, more commonly known as Christ the King Sunday, a day when we affirm our allegiance to one master and look forward to the return and reign of Jesus. Now, there are a number of reasons for people to dislike a day called Christ the King. In our country in particular, there's something inherently un-American about being a self-avowed monarchist. Our national identity is founded upon the casting off of royalty, and yet here we are as Christians making the claim that our ultimate allegiance is to be found at the foot of the throne of God. In fact, there are some who carry that logic to its end, who reject the idea of Christ the King on the grounds that any claim of God's kingship or lordship is flawed because it's rooted in patriarchal and hierarchical ideas. If you've ever heard someone talk about the kingdom of God rather than the kingdom of God, it's because of this discomfort with hierarchy. Likewise, those who choose to call this day the reign of Christ Sunday tend to do so because it removes the gendered language around Christ's rule and softens the image of a king presiding over his subjects. <clears throat> So whether you're a red-blooded American patriot who will not suffer a king or the most progressive social justice warrior who seeks to dismantle any form of inequality, it would say, seem that the claim that Jesus Christ is our king remains as provocative and controversial a statement 
as it was on those nights long ago when the wise men from the east went in search of the true-born king of Israel. Why, then, do we celebrate a day with so much potential to challenge or offend? To answer that question, we must return to our scriptures and see what the author of Hebrews has to say to us today about who our Christ is. Thus far in this letter, we've heard about Christ and his role as our high priest, how he's able to make a sacrifice of himself one time for all people in all times and in all places that will offer atonement for our sins and thereby secure our salvation, leading to our eternal life with him. And now we're being introduced to another role that Christ plays. We've been instructed to run with perseverance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith, who for the sake of joy that was set before him endured the cross, disregarding its shame, and has taken his seat at the right hand of the throne of God. Of course, the author of Hebrews is far from the only biblical writer to use this imagery. If you've been coming to Bible study or following along at home, then you know we've spent a lot of time so far in the book of Revelation in the heavenly throne room. The writings and the prophets, notably those like Daniel, which we heard this morning, Ezekiel and Isaiah, all also describe visions of God enthroned in the highest heavens. But is it enough for us to keep this language simply on the basis that it's used often by the authors of Scripture to try and describe our relationship to God? I think you all know that I'm about the furthest thing from a biblical literalist or fundamentalist that one can be while also still claiming that Scripture is an authoritative source of God's revelation. And while I do believe that we ought to interrogate the cultural assumptions that the authors of Scripture bring to their writing, I also cannot ignore that the Holy Spirit inspired so many of them to use such similar images over the span of centuries in order to help us understand the reality of God. Nor can I ignore the potency of the Lord God Almighty and his Son, the Prince of Peace, as symbols that convey to us a deeper understanding of reality. Everybody serves something. Maybe the thing you serve is a political party or a cause. Maybe you're only interested in serving yourself. Maybe your service is bound up in familial ties. Maybe you live in service of money and things. Whatever the case may be, we all have to make choices about where our allegiance will lie. And Christ himself knew this when he warned us that we cannot serve two masters. In moments of difficult decision-making, there can be only one allegiance that comes out on top. So let us consider why that allegiance that wins out should be Jesus Christ every time. First of all, I would argue that we're fortunate in offering our allegiance to Christ as King because that is a personal relationship. While seeing the king upon his throne expresses an otherness, a, a distance of power and authority between us and God, it also expresses a personal relationship. We happy to be lucky enough to serve the God of all creation who is life itself and who holds the keys to the gates of hell and the doors of the highest heavens. Very lofty titles and yet also an embodied being who can stand by my side. In those moments of temptation, we should not underestimate the power of imagining God standing at our side as we make our choices in life. I don't want to trivialize this relationship, but it, it is like a more mature version of a child who decides to do something nice rather than naughty because they don't want Santa Claus to find out about their misdeeds. More than that, we serve a being who not only stood by our side, but died on our behalf. Consider the coronation ceremony for Christ. Ask yourself where it took place. 
Was it in a great cathedral with all the trappings of a royal office? Crowns, jewels, robes, scepters, the the sorts of things we saw in the recent ascension of King Charles III? No. Where did his coronation take place? On a hill called Golgotha, with a crown of thorns piercing his head as he was nailed to a cross. So my second point is this. The king we serve is not like the masters of this world. He does not ask us to go anywhere that he would not go himself or do anything that he has not done himself. He may call us into places where our faithfulness leads to death, as has happened to many saints before, but he has already blazed that path for us. In other words, even in serving our king, we are not being exploited for his sake or for his selfish gain. We are engaged in a relationship of mutuality. So yes, we serve the king on high, the Lord of lords, but it is not like any relationship that has ever existed between king and subject before in human history. Our service is not rooted in compulsion, but in gratitude for that which Christ has already done on our behalf. Third, I think particularly as Americans, and especially those of us who are straight, white, male Americans, It is good for us to be challenged when it comes to our perception of our power and our independence. Women, people of color, queer folks, the working poor, the disabled, all have have plenty of lived experiences that demonstrate what it is to be denied power and autonomy. Yet the American dream still includes a mythos around being someone who is self-reliant, a master of business and all else around you. And far too often, even among those from marginalized communities, there's a tendency once one has climbed to the heights of power and riches to pull the ladder up behind oneself and act as if there is something singular and unique about yourself that has resulted in you being where you are. We love the idea of the self-made billionaire, despite the fact that there is no such thing. And we want to imagine that any day now, things will align and we too will sit atop the pyramid. It is good for us to be reminded that in the grand scheme of things, we are small potatoes. We sometimes need that moment that Job had of seeing God in the whirlwind and being confronted with the truth that our lives are short and our power is insignificant. It gets us over our own egos and our own self-aggrandizement and actually makes us more able to matter in the world because suddenly we are forced to reconcile with the fact that everyone is as as deserving of life love and peace as we are. In an ironic way then, conceding that there is one king and one master in Jesus Christ actually elevates the dignity and equality of every human being. So to summarize why it matters for us to proclaim that Christ is king, Everybody has to serve something, so you might as well serve a master that wants to be in relationship with you, that does not compel you into obedience, but died on your behalf to win your freedom and to earn your gratitude, and that inspires you toward greater love of humanity. And if you think that that is a master worth serving, then I'm going to encourage you once again to get out there and share the good news. Invite everyone that you know to come and meet our King. Everyone deserves to know what life is like in the kingdom of God, but they will not find their way here without you to guide them. Amen. Amen. Please pray with me. Prince of Peace, We thank you today for letting us be in service to you. Thank you for for freeing us from slavery to sin and death so that we might work in your kingdom of love and life. We pledge ourselves to you now and forever. Amen.